If you don't have a Bible and you want to follow along with us, uh, you can open up the Pew Bible that's there and turn to page 977, and you'll find the passage that we're going to be looking at in Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, looking forward to what God's going to do. Our church is about Jesus. We sing about Jesus. We want to live our lives in obedience to Jesus, doing what he says, but we also want to be like him. And we want to reflect his character, we want to reflect his love, and we want to be his body to the world because that's what he has described us, his church. He's described us as his body, not just a body, but his body. We are his hands and we are his feet. And we have a great responsibility in the world to be more like him so the world can see him for who he is and for what he's done. I don't know if you knew this. You probably figured it out by, just by looking at me, but I'm a bodybuilder. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <clears throat> You're supposed to encourage your pastor, okay? I, I don't have the DNA, I don't think, to be like the massive bodybuilders. But one of the things that I often did when I was in high school and in college playing sports is that we lifted weights so that we could strengthen ourselves and condition ourselves so that we could be better, quicker, faster, stronger, all of those things. And uh, after I graduated from high school, I knew that I was going to Cedarville, uh, and I knew that I was planning to play basketball at Cedarville. And uh, so during that summer, I was working on a pretty strong regiment of weightlifting, uh, running, and then doing all sorts of basketball drills. And there was a guy from my high school who had graduated a couple of years ahead of me, and he was playing ball over at Defiance College. And he and I uh, kind of got together and said, hey, let's, let's work out together and let's help each other as we get ready for the new season. Well, one day we're in my high school gymnasium, or not in the gymnasium, but in the weight room at the high school, and we were doing squats. And we had, I don't know how much we had on there. It must have been like 150, 160 pounds maybe, which doesn't sound like a lot. But uh, back then I was, I, did, I was a little bit skinnier than I am now. So I, I've got this, this rack on my shoulders and I'm, and of course you have to scream when you do it because if you don't scream when you do it, it's just, and I'm thinking back to all the Rocky movies, you know, and I'm like hearing the, the soundtrack in my head and and I'm not fighting Apollo Creed, but I kept saying, Creed, Creed, you know, just because of all of that. So my friend and I were taking turns, you know, doing these squats, and we think, man, we got the big weight belt on, and we're walking around. Of course, we don't have to walk like this because we don't have the arms like that. But we're doing this, and this guy walks in. And this guy graduated a few years ahead of both of us. And he went to our high school, and he was 6'7", now I'm 6'5", and he was 6'7", 310 pounds, Red hair, red beard, and he played at the University of Finley, and then he actually played for the Cincinnati Bengals the year that they went on strike. He got to play as what they called one of those, the scabs. I don't know if you remember that. So he, he played football, and he's lifted weights a lot. He walks, he has to walk like this. He walks in, and he says, hey, guys, what are you doing? You doing arm curls? And he grabbed what we were squatting And he put it back up on the bar, and we were just standing there. <laughs> Meow. <laughs> and we left, and we just like finished our, our workout. I don't have the DNA of a bodybuilder, but I am concerned about my body. I want my body to be healthy. I want to exercise my body. I want to uh, do what is necessary to keep my body in shape because I want to be healthy. Did you know that Jesus is a bodybuilder? Jesus himself is a bodybuilder. And you might not be thinking it in the way that may be correct, because you're thinking, really? He likes to push weights, and he likes to wear the, the weight belts, and he likes to scream creed, you know? When, no. He doesn't do that, but he's a bodybuilder because his goal and his purpose, after he has redeemed us and saved us, is that he is building his body. And you are a part of his body, and he is wanting to build you. He's wanting to build us together into his body so that we can accomplish his purpose in the world today. 
And I hope to show you today Jesus' bodybuilding plan as we look at the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. And I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning, and I'm going to invite you to say this with me as we begin our time together, because we look to the Scriptures because it is our authority. We look to the Scriptures because it is God's Word, and we need to conform our life to what the Scripture says. So will you say this with me? This is my Bible. It is the very Word of God. It is true and without error. It has authority over all peoples, in all places, in all times. Today, my heart is ready to submit to God's authority. By His grace, I will apply His Word to my life. I stand on His truth for His glory. I can never be the same in Jesus' name. I want you to pray with me this morning, and here's what I want you to pray. I want you to say, Lord, show me how I am helping to build your body. And then I want you to pray, Lord, show me how I might be hindering the building of your body. And then we're going to dive into Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at Jesus' bodybuilding plan. Will you pray those things, and then I'll pray, and then we'll begin. Lord, it's an honor for us to be here today. It's an honor for us to be able to open your word and to study it together. Father, it's an honor to be called your child and to be a part of your body, the church. And Father, I pray for the believers who are here today that you would help them to see how they are helping to build your body here. Father, we want to be a part of your plan. And so we pray that as we see this in the scriptures, that you would help us to throw all of our eggs in that basket and to, to get after it and to pursue it and to build your body. And Father, show us where we might be hindering the building of your body here. Show us what we need to repent of so that we don't interfere with your plan. And Father, we're not here to glorify ourselves. We're not here to talk about ourselves. We're here to talk about you. We're here to lift up Jesus, and we do want to build his body here. So we pray that you would help us to do that. Give us ears that we might hear. Give us a heart that is willing to obey. And give us hands that will faithfully execute what we hear so that we can point people to you. And we'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remain standing while I read, Ephesians chapter 4, page 977 in your pew Bible, verse 11 we read this last week, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine." by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. I thought I was pretty clever this week as I was studying, as I was preparing, and as I was reading through this passage and thinking about how to start it and thinking about him building his church, and I came up with the idea that Jesus is a bodybuilder, and I thought, wow, that is so cool. Well, then I found out that, you know, other people have kind of already thought about that, and, uh, and I found this picture. Jesus is a bodybuilder. He's building his body, the church. And we talked last week about the fact that he has given. Jesus is the giver who gives. He gave the church gifts. He gave gifts to the church so that the church would build itself up. We are his body. And one of the gifts that he gave to the church are the leaders, the shepherds, the pastors, 
the pastors and teachers, and those words in verse 11 uh, that talk about the pastors, the shepherds, and the teachers, both of those are connected together, not shepherds and then teachers separate, but the shepherd teachers, the pastor teachers. He gave them to the church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And we really focused our energy last week on the fact that the pastoral leadership team, our paid pastors, our non-paid pastors, which comprise our pastor elder team, our task, our job description is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And the requirement of the saints is to do the work of the ministry. And as we think about going further in this passage, we see Jesus' bodybuilding plan. And it starts with the fact that he gives these leaders to equip the saints But then it goes on to the work of the saints, and it goes on to what the goal of this whole plan is supposed to accomplish. And as we think about Jesus being the bodybuilder, and as we think about looking at what it says here in verse 13, or sorry, verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. Jesus is a bodybuilder, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're going to look at five statements about Jesus' plan for building his body. And the first one is focused on what he focuses on at the very beginning of this chapter. It's unity. Jesus builds his body for unity. He doesn't build us to live separate lives that are totally disconnected from one another. He doesn't call us to separate ministries that are totally disconnected from one another. He calls us to be unified together into one body, accomplishing one plan and one purpose, and that is to make Christ followers of all peoples. It doesn't matter what your spiritual gift is. It doesn't matter how God has wired you with natural talents. It doesn't matter how he has wired you in your personality. All of us have been given the task of making Christ followers of all peoples. That's a mandate that he's given to the church. We are the church. And he wants us to be unified when we do that. Look at how this passage sort of breaks down a little bit. He says, He wants us to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry until we all attain, verse 13, the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. We are to be unified in faith and we're to be unified in our knowledge of who God is. That's why it's very important for us to teach sound doctrine because our our faith is built upon the doctrine that is in the Scriptures. And doctrine is not a negative word. It's not a word that divides, contrary to popular opinion in today's church. Doctrine doesn't divide. Doctrine unites. False doctrine divides. Misunderstandings of doctrine divides. But doctrine unites. Go back and read the book of Acts. We've talked about this before. It says that the, the apostles were all together, and they were unified, and their unity came under the apostles' teaching. And teaching is doctrine. So God wants us to be unified. He wants his body to be unified. And just think for a moment what it would look like if your personal body was not unified. I talk about this in the membership class. And I think in a couple weeks ago in the membership class I talked about this. And my mind, I like to have, well, I have an active imagination. Whether I like it or not, I have an active imagination. And I hope that since I've been saved, it's a sanctified imagination. I mean, I have moments sometimes, but hopefully it's sanctified. But the only thing that I can think of to kind of describe this whole unity, when we think about the body of Christ, he wants us to be unified like our human bodies are unified. Now, how many of you had to have a a heart-to-heart, well, it's hard to have a heart-to-heart conversation with your hand, but how many of you had a heart-to-heart conversation with your hand this morning to tell your hand what you wanted it to do? Anybody? Anybody? In fact, if somebody in your family or in your dorm saw you talking to your hand this morning, they might think that your body's in trouble and that there's something wrong with the brain that's in the body. But you didn't have that conversation with your hand because your hand automatically does what the brain tells it to do. Right? There's, the brain doesn't send a message to the hand uh, and says, pick up, you know, 
that glass of water and the hand says, nope, not going to do it. And you're like, I want you to pick up le uh, left hand. I want to tell the right hand, help the right hand to pick. Nope, I'm not going to. You see where I'm going with this, right? I'm not a huge fan of Jim Carrey, but I can only imagine Jim Carrey acting out something like this where the hand all of a sudden just starts doing what it wants to do. And as I'm trying to preach to you this morning, if I were to do this through the entire service, you would really have a hard time focusing on what I'm saying, right? And if my leg started to do the same thing, and I'm saying you need to trust Jesus and you need to follow after Jesus with all of your heart, some of you would be like, what is going on? You'd be saying, You'd be calling the elders, go lay hands on him and cast that demon from that boy. The body, our human body, always works together in unity. It never argues with itself. Are you sure? Yes, I am. Don't talk out loud here. No, what? My precious. <laughs> our body never, never argues with itself. We always work together to accomplish a task. The whole body is at work when I pick up a speaker and Pastor Jason's saying, no, don't do that. <laughs> and that's the type of unity that Christ wants his body, the church, to have. We are one. We are united by one faith. We are united by one body of knowledge in the person of Jesus Christ. His death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and his soon coming return, that is what unites us. And he has placed his spirit in each of us when we call on, upon him to save us. When we acknowledge our sin and we believe that he died for us and we say, Jesus, save me a sinner, at that moment, he puts us into the, his kingdom and he puts his spirit in us. And you have his spirit and I have his spirit and we all have his spirit dwelling within us and therefore we should be unified. Right? It's the picture of the body. And Jesus builds his body for unity. In fact, he prayed about that in John chapter 17. He prayed for his disciples immediately, but then he goes on and he prayed for us because he said, even for those who will believe, I pray that they would be one like you and, you and me, Father, like we're one. I want them to be one. So why don't we see that more in churches today? Why don't we see more unity? Because this is his plan for building his body. He's building his body for unity. But he's also building his body for maturity. Look at what the text says. Let's go on and see what it says. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, verse 13, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And notice that he says, until, which means we got a long road to walk because it's going to take a long time to get there, but we're walking together to accomplish that. And then the second part of verse 13, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The word mature there means to be mature in one's behavior. If you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, it says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me, so that we may present everyone mature in in Christ. Maturity is a great thing, isn't it? Amen. It's a great thing. I love my children. I have three. And Sarah and I, as parents, we have loved every stage of life that our children have been in. We loved them when they were tiny babies and in the midst of the dirty nappies, diapers, and, you know, all those different things. And we loved that stage of life, but we were glad when the diapers were gone. 
We loved the stage of life when they were watching Barney the Dinosaur, but I was so glad when that dinosaur never showed up on my TV again. And we loved them when they were in middle school, and we loved them when they were in high school, and now that they're in college, and now that Abigail's married, and they're growing into uh, maturity and adulthood, we're loving this time now. I don't want my 22-year-old, my 20-year-old, or my 18-year-old acting like a baby. You wouldn't want that for your children either. When you, take, or when you ask them to give you something or you do something, you know, the, the law of the two-year-old, what is mine is mine and what is yours is mine, give that to me. I want that back. And you say, we're going to share with Johnny over here. No! Some of you are still in that phase right now, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry to bring up a painful memory, but that is, you look at that and you would say, that's immaturity, Right? It's okay for a two-year-old to do that the first time, and then as parents, we lead them and show them the way in which they should walk. But I don't want my 22-year-old, my 20-year-old, and my 18-year-old acting like that because there's something to be said about maturity. And Christ, in his bodybuilding plan, he wants to build his body for unity, but he also wants to build his body for maturity, He doesn't want a bunch of baby Christians running around crying and throwing their toys out of the cot when things don't go the way that they want them to. He wants them to respond to difficulties of life with maturity, which is why he says in James chapter 1 verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, so that the testing of your faith may develop what? Perseverance. And that you might be complete, mature, not lacking in anything. When we face trials, he wants us to respond in a mature way. When we face difficulties, he wants us to respond in a mature way. When we face conflict in the church, he wants us to respond in a mature way. He doesn't want us acting like a bunch of two-year-olds. And so his plan for building his body includes unity, but his plan for building the body also includes maturity. What does spiritual maturity look like in a church today? That's what he's trying to build with his body. The third sort of part of his bodybuilding plan is that he's building his body for quantity. And now this one's going to be a little bit weird for you. You're like, what do you mean, pastor? Jesus builds his body for quantity. Well, look at what it says. You go back to Ephesians 4, and you get to the end of the phrase, to mature manhood, and then it says, to the measure of the stature of the what? The fullness of what? Christ. Christ. Jesus wants you to be full of him. He wants you to be full of him, full of his character, full of his love, full of his self-control, full of his patience, full of his kindness, full of his mercy, full of his grace, full of everything that he is. He wants you to experience it in massive quantities. Not just a little bit. He said that I have come that they might have life and that life more abundantly. He wants us in our Christian experience to experience the fullness of Christ. And as we look at his bodybuilding plan, he's given the shepherds, the teachers, the pastors to equip the saints. So we've got to do our job. The saints have to do their job. And when we're all doing our job, there's unity. When we're all doing our job, there's maturity. When we're all working together, there's the quantity. We're experiencing the fullness of Christ. And we need each other to experience the fullness of Christ because we don't have all of the spiritual gifts. My wife and I often comment that we both don't feel like we have the gift of mercy. When we were doing youth ministry, We'd have teenagers that would complain and say, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want to be, I don't want to do this game. Well, if you can barf up a lung right now and show me that you can't do this game, then we won't let you do the game, okay? I had one try it one time. They were, it's, okay, you can't barf, okay, get back in there. Stop being foolish. Well, I'm sick. Okay, well, have you thrown up yet? No, get back in there. No mercy. This one little girl one time, she was playing on the playground, and she hit the concrete hard, face first. And she got up, and you know how children, when they get up, they're like looking for sympathy? And as soon as they see sympathy, they start crying. We're like, all right, good job, get up, let's go. And she's like, got up, and she started going. No mercy. But I'm glad that God has gifted other people with mercy. Because we need it. We as a body need it. We can't experience the fullness of Christ by ourselves. We are not islands. We are not self-sufficient. We are not independent of anything or anyone. We are massively, totally dependent upon God. And by virtue of his giftedness and by virtue of his design for the body, we are dependent upon one another. And he wants us to experience not just a little bit of Jesus. He wants us to experience the fullness of Jesus. And that's the end to which we are working as a body. Because that's part of his bodybuilding plan. He's building his church for unity. He's building his church for maturity. And he's building his church, his body, for quantity. The fourth one that we want to look at is that Jesus builds his body for stability. Look at how the text goes on. Verse 14. All of this is taking place until we reach the unity of faith, knowledge of the Son of God, mature manhood. We're experiencing the fullness of Christ. Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. He's building his body for stability. He doesn't want us wavering like the waves. He doesn't want us to be blown about by every new fad that comes along. He wants us to be anchored. He wants us to be stable. He wants us to to be firm in who he is and how he has revealed himself to us. We don't like to be unstable, do we? If you're going to walk out on a dock or walk out onto a bridge that's spanning a gulf that could result in your death, you don't want to walk out on a bridge that is not stable, right? Because instability produces fear. And fear oftentimes produces inaction. And Jesus wants us to be stable so that we're not being blown about. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at this. Oh, this church is doing this. Oh, this church is doing that. Oh, our community is doing this. Oh, our culture is doing this. He wants us to be stable. He's building us for stability. If something's out of whack in our bodies and we begin to be a little bit shaky, our whole body suffers from that, doesn't it? He wants us to be stable. That's part of his bodybuilding plan, is that we would not be blown about by every wind and wave. And over in Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says this, Make sure that I get the right verse. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, he wants us to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, 
He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He wants us to experience the fullness of Christ. He wants us to be unwavering and stable. And he says, let's hold fast to the confession without wavering. If you've ever been to the ocean, you know that the waves can be quite hectic sometimes. And when we lived in Durban, we lived five minutes away from the Indian Ocean, and we would go there as a family sometimes, and uh, we'd go out to the waves. And I used to love going out into the waves until I reached, I don't know, as I got older, it just kind of hit me a lot harder. But you'd try to stand your ground, and then this big wave comes, and it just knocks you out. I mean, literally, some people like got knocked out, but uh, it knocks you over, it knocks your feet out from underneath you, and all of a sudden, you who thought you were standing so strong, this wave hits you, and all of a sudden, you're tumbling and turning, and you don't know which end is up, and then finally, you land, and you get your foot, and then you stand up, and then you turn back, and you look at your friend and say, that was awesome, and as you're saying, that's awesome, another wave hits you from behind, and it knocks you over, and you're unstable. Jesus is building his body for stability. He's putting gifts that he's given to the church to make us firm in our convictions, making us firm in our commitment to one another, making us firm in the mission that he's given to us. So Jesus' bodybuilding plan also involves integrity. He's building his body for integrity. And we need to go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And we need to see this when we jump down to around verse 15. Instead of being blown around by every wind of doctrine, verse 15 says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in what? When we talk about integrity, we talk about the integrity of a building, the, building of the, the, the integrity of a building is compromised when cracks start to appear. When maybe a foundation wasn't laid properly or a wall wasn't built properly, the integrity of the structure comes into question. Jesus not only is using this building metaphor in the construction world, he's saying that he wants his body to be built up together into him who is the head. And this building up of his body comes in the context of truth and in the context of love. And so as he's laying out this bodybuilding plan for us, he wants the church to be built in integrity, for integrity. The Bible says the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in Ephesians chapter 2. And then Christ is the cornerstone of the building that holds everything together. We align ourselves with the cornerstone. And Peter tells us that we're all living stones who are being built together. And so he wants our building, not the physical building, the building of our bodies, our lives together to represent integrity. That we are connected to him who is the head If we think about Jesus, last week we looked at the fact that he was the giver who gives. The week before that, we looked at the fact that he was the word in action. And today, the message titled is The Builder is Building, because Jesus is still building his church. He's still building his people. And there are more people that need to be added to the building. And the example that we see of Jesus in Scripture is that He gives, He serves, and He builds. And if we're going to look more like Jesus, if we're going to say that we're a Christ follower, then we need to be giving, we need to be serving, and we need to be building. And so I want to ask you this question as we close. What are you doing to build Christ's body at Southgate? You say, I'm building the kingdom, brother. I'm not building a church. Go back and read the New Testament. The majority of the letters in the New Testament were written to local churches. 
Not big C church, little C church. He's placed you in a church to use your gifts to serve the body and to build the body up. So it makes sense for us to ask the question, what are we doing to build the body here at Southgate? And you've got to make it more personal than that and say, what am I doing to build the body at Southgate? And if he's building the church towards unity and towards maturity, towards quantity, filling the fullness of Christ, towards stability and towards integrity, then what are you doing to hinder Christ's body at Southgate? What do we do that gets in the way of building those things that we see in the Scriptures? What are we doing that makes the church look like this thing is doing this part, and this part's doing this part, and this part's doing another part? I mean, that looks ridiculous when I do that, doesn't it? Some of you are going to go home and say, hey, don't, go, don't go back to Southgate. If you're visiting for the, for the first time, you know, don't go back to, uh, to Southgate. That pastor's a little weird when he preaches. He's got something in his shorts or something. I don't know what's going on. But just as you look at that and you say, that's absolutely ridiculous, right? Let's agree that that picture is absolutely ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous when the church is operating like that. Because we're supposed to be unified. That's what Christ is building. He's building unity. So what are we doing that hinders the body from that? And the last question, how are you actively serving here? We value active service, and that's why we want our people to engage His church. If we're going to be more like Jesus, we're going to engage His church. We're going to engage His body. We're not going to distance ourselves from it. We're not going to fall away from it because it's His body. You know, as a pastor, I have to do a lot of reading for study, for preparation, have to do a lot of reading for personal growth. And there are a lot of books out there that you can find in the Christian bookstores and in the scholarly sections and all these different sections where people are bad-mouthing the church. They're saying the church is ineffective, the church has failed, the church is not effectively engaging their culture, the church is this, the church is that, we need to reinvent the church, we need to do all of that. And I always want to caution those people, if I have an opportunity to talk to them, to say, be careful because when you speak negatively about the church, you're speaking negatively about Jesus. Because the church is Jesus' body. And the church, yeah, there's some things that need to improve but it's the body of Christ. I have not given up on the church because the church is the body of Jesus. And if Jesus is going to speak in the world today, if He's going to do anything in the world today, He's going to do it through the church. That is the divine means by which He is accomplishing His mission. And the great news is that we get to be a part of that. We are a part of that. And so we're going to pray that Christ will build us so that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. Will you stand with me and pray? Father, it's it's amazing for us to think that Your salvation involves a whole lot more than just redeeming us and rescuing us from sin and from hell. You've not only saved us from the condemnation of hell, but you've saved us to this amazing purpose in life to be your representative, to be your voice, to be your hands and your feet, and to be a part of an organization, an organism, that you've created and you've birthed. Oh, Lord, help us to treat the church with the reverence and the respect that it deserves. Because Jesus, you said you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I pray that you would prevent the gates of hell from prevailing against Southgate. I pray that you would stir and work in the hearts of your people 
a passion for you, a passion for your word, and a passion for accomplishing the mission that you've given to us. Father, the times that we are living in are desperate, and the world needs the church to do something. And I pray that we, as we desire to be more like Jesus, that we, like our Savior, would give and serve and build so that we can reflect you and so that we can accomplish your purpose. Father, I pray that your Spirit would breathe new life into us, that you would show us how we might be hindering your work and that we might repent and that we might bring our thinking in line with your thinking and that you would continue to do a great work through this body. Oh, Lord, I believe our best days are yet to come, but they're going to be difficult days, days that we have to depend upon your Spirit to do the work through us because our culture is not making it easier. I pray that you would be glorified in this body, whether by, li whether by life or by death, that you would be glorified at Southgate. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.